All right. Good morning. All right. Good afternoon. Oh, look at that. It just ships right along. All right. So, welcome back. Today we're going to be doing a little bit of a review of history. Uh, my experience has been that understanding IPM uh, is it's often very helpful uh, to look at IPM from the context of what we were doing before we were doing IPM, getting an idea of how pest control was done, and that way you can sort of see how IPM differs from that and uh, some of its advantages. And uh, just generally allows us to be maybe a little bit thankful we're living uh, where we are now, though I'm sure someone in the next thousand years will be looking back at us like we're barbarians in the dark ages of, uh, of agriculture. But anyway, just some announcements. Uh, you got the email about the quizzes that are on Blackboard. So I mentioned these on the first day. Essentially what these are, these are short quizzes. There are only two questions. And they cover the material that is in the lecture reading. So this will typically be a chapter from Flint. So the IPM and practice book that the PCA exam is based off of. Though sometimes it may be from Hanigo and Rice, the book from Economic Entomology. They may be readings from scientific journals, uh, or maybe even like um, extension notices, things like that. Uh, but all that information will be in the syllabus, and extra readings will be posted to Blackboard. You'll be able to find them there. Uh, these readings are due before lecture, so they're due up to 12.29 on the day of lecture. And they, essentially what it comes down to is there's two questions, each are worth one point. They will generally be multiple choice because you do these in your free time on Blackboard. It's open book, so you can look up answers as you need. Uh, again, the questions will be directly from the book. In a lot of cases, I use the exact language the book uses so that you, I'm not trying to be tricky here. Um, uh, one thing though, it is five minutes to complete. So when you open the test, you'll have five minutes. If you haven't completed the two multiple choice questions by that point, it will close. Um, and it'll be over. You won't have a chance to retake it. So make sure that you're prepped before you open it up and that you're ready to go. So I've got two of these posted. One was the quiz for last Thursday. I didn't get it up in time. Uh, so. And then the other one is the quiz for next Thursday. Uh, both of these are due uh, on this upcoming Thursday by 1229. Yes? Is there going to be a quiz for each day of lecture, before, due before each day of lecture? Or is it just once a week? Once a week or something. It'll probably be before each day of lecture. Um, ideally, I'll have these posted more along the lines of a week in advance instead of three days like this one. This is just, I call the hike schedule, and it's my mistake. So I'll try not to do this to you again on sort of this relatively short notice. Any other questions about the quizzes? Okay. And a reminder, there are, I believe with the current schedule, there are only 22 quizzes. Uh, your total score from the quizzes will be the top 20 scores. So if you miss lecture uh, for whatever reason, or if you, for whatever reason, just don't take the quiz, that score will be dropped if it's a zero, uh, at least twice. Uh, lab today, we're going to be in Ag 229. So that's just the room directly up from 119. Uh, it's the computer lab. Uh, also, last announcement, we have uh, essentially passed the drop period for administrative drops. So at this point, any drops that are going to happen have occurred. Uh, so I don't think I had to administratively drop anyone, but there were some people who did drop the course. So if you're on the wait list, I would encourage you just to check uh, you know, your My Fresno State account just to see uh, whether or not you are officially enrolled or not. Uh, if you aren't, then at this point, chances are you won't be getting in. All right. All right, so like I mentioned earlier, we're going to be going over sort of the history of pest control, where we've been and where we're going. And today we're covering uh, prehistory up through the Renaissance, and I think we might get all the way up to uh, kind of World War II and the birth of synthetic insecticides and how that kind of shook things <laughs> up. But so to get back to, well, so real quick, just to set us off on the right foot, what is a pest? 
Anything that causes a nuisance to human activities. Yeah, essentially. Yeah. Anything that is a nuisance organism to human activities, whether that uh, it consumes our food, uh, it bites us, it transmits diseases, um, it gets inside our house and is really stinky, like stink bugs are. You know, there's pest is kind of an amorphous term, but it's any organism that causes us any sort of general nuisance harm. And so, if we want to go all the way back to sort of the emergence of humans, humans started out as these hunter gatherers. And so they didn't really have a lot of these uh, areas for pests to be nuisances. We didn't have uh, permanent homes. Uh, there weren't really crops because agriculture hadn't been uh, invented yet. So most pests were limited to things that caused physical discomfort or transmitted diseases. And so largely, control at this point was sort of physical. It was a matter of slapping, maybe sitting a little closer to a smoky fire. You know, relatively limited control. Now where this shifted primarily was with the invention of agriculture, which was roughly 10,000 years ago. So we're talking, so if I say YA on the screen, that just means years ago. So we're talking about 8,000 before Common Era. And with agriculture, we saw basically pests coming into direct competition uh, with humans for food. And this is when we really start to see the emergence of a lot of these common pests that are associated with people. Uh, on one hand, uh, we're talking about direct competition in the field and stored foods. So pests basically feeding on our crops that are sitting in the ground. We've got pests that are, uh, you know, feeding on our storage so that even things that we successfully reared all the way out are not guaranteed to be safe uh, before we eat them. And then we also see the fact that during agriculture, humans start to congregate together into settlements. No longer are they these nomadic folks sort of traveling around, following whatever they're hunting or gathering. All of a sudden, you've got permanent homes and uh, large concentrations of people. So you start to see them, diseases emerging. It's easier for diseases to hop from person to person if those people are close by. It's easier to transmit diseases through things like um, waste products, uh, especially if you've got lots of people around using communal toilets or open sewers. And we're seeing this not just in humans, but also in the domesticated animals they have. Because now we're starting to see animals being uh, brought up not in open ranges, but in closed off areas. And so the invention of agriculture and the general trend of humans becoming sort of a sen not sentient, excuse me, sedentary, more uh, enclosed um, civilizations really led to a big step up in pests and got people thinking about how do we actually start controlling these? How do we make our lives better? So pest outbreaks are known and they are recorded quite a ways back. There's a fair number of references to locust swarms in both the Bible and the Quran. Uh, I mean, in the obvious story would be the plagues uh, in Egypt with the story of Moses that the locusts were the eighth plague, they came in and they basically ate the crops of the Egyptians in really bad case of locusts, uh, like the Rocky Mountain locusts I talked about in economic entomology, you would have very large swarms that would eat the clothes off your back. There are reports of Rocky Mountain locusts eating wooden handles off of tools. You know, they'll just come through and really decimate things. Uh, locusts also were reported because oftentimes when they swarmed through, all you had left to eat were locusts. And so locusts were considered halal and kosher in those cultures. So you could eat them. And there are stories, uh, even in the Bible, such as John the Baptist, who uh, supposedly lived in the wilderness, baptizing people, completely subsisting off of locusts and wild honey. So there's this precedent that locusts were around and were a reality for people. Um, and there's even cave paintings going as far back as nine to 10,000 years ago, so right around the um, time when crops first emerged, suggesting that pretty shortly after we started growing crops in large numbers, these pests started showing up very quickly. So this guy actually, this is even a locust that is portrayed in um, a hunt mural from um, Horemhab's uh, burial chamber. So he was an Egyptian pharaoh who was from 1400 BCE. So that would have been about 3,400 years ago. But so, as far as early pest control was concerned, it seems that at the very beginning of uh, sort of this agricultural revolution, people didn't have a really firm idea 
of why pests were showing up and uh, what to do about them. And so a lot of talk about pests was really focused around sort of this idea that pests were caused by angry gods. And so you did something bad and the gods are punishing you. Alternatively, in sort of Greek or Roman societies, where the gods basically were like a bunch of petty high school students all fighting with each other all the time, uh, you know, you might not have even done anything wrong. A god might just be being petty and obnoxious and dropping pests into your field for no reason. And so you can't do anything about it. But anyway, so oftentimes, uh, to get rid of pests, the idea was you had to go to the gods and you had to placate them. And so... Um, there are, as you see this interestingly in a lot of these gods, uh, sort of from these older societies like the Greeks, where many gods had a whole range of things that they supposedly had powers over, and um, you found that various pests were associated with different gods. So like Hercules was considered the fly catcher, so he was the god who if you had fly problems, you would go to Hercules and ask for him to relieve your flies. Zeus had control over locusts and worms, and then Apollo was over mice and mildews. Uh, and there's a whole list of these. But I thought Apollo was interesting because um, he actually was sometimes referred to as Apollo Smithius. You would see this in the, the literature. And uh, that stood for Lord of Mice. And if you would go to some of his uh, temples, they would intentionally build um, under his altar these little chambers for the mice to live in. And so when people would visit, you could leave offerings to the mice as an offering to Apollo and a way to placate mice. Is this um, coin where you have the circle on the PowerPoint? Yes. Is that a road in that picture? It is. There we go. You, uh, you got there right before I did. So what we have here is a coin of, uh, of Apollo from uh, back in the Greek era. And yeah, sure enough, you see some of these pests actually showing up in these coins. They were considered such an important aspect of the gods. That yeah, on this Apollo coin, you've got a little uh, mouse or a rat here on the side. So you got, yeah, sort of the standard Apollo and yeah, a little rat. All right, but it wasn't all mystic. As agriculture progressed, we started to see people who were discovering that, you know, there were things you could do besides praying to the gods that actually were effective against pests, and these things slowly built up. So around like 2500 BCE, so again, that's about 4,500 years ago, the Sumerians discovered that you could use sulfur uh, on your plants to control certain pest insects. And so this is really the first recorded use of pesticides, of a chemical being used to control pests. Chances are that people were doing something before this. This is just the first record that we have that we absolutely know occurred at a certain time. Excuse me. Excuse me. Uh, by 1500 BC, we have records suggesting that people were uh, using cultural control, uh, alternating their planting dates, so they would either plant early or late, depending on what the pest cycle is, in order to avoid the worst infestations. And then in 1200 BC, uh, there's evidence that the Chinese had developed botanical insecticides. So essentially, they had discovered ways to um, extract insecticidal compounds from plants, and what they would do is when they planted their seeds, they would pour that extract over the seeds in order to uh, protect them from various worms, uh, uh, grub-type larvae that were in the soil. And further, there were other various uh, discoveries. The Chinese were really ahead on a lot of this stuff. They figured out that you could treat with mercury or arsenic in the hair uh, for lice and fleas, excuse me, chalk and wood ash for indoor pests, all sorts of stuff like that. <coughs> And then uh, as we progressed into sort of the Greek and Roman era, we saw a whole lot of discoveries being made very quickly. Uh, the Greeks and the Romans put a lot of stock, uh, not just in the gods controlling things, but also in sort of a, maybe not 100% scientific, but they were moving towards that scientific way of thinking, using evidence and um, testing in order to see what worked and spreading that information around. And so we see things like in 950 BC, Homer suggesting that you could burn crops to prevent locusts, You've got uh, fumigants being used 350 BC, and 13 BC, uh, Marcus Polio designed this, this granary right here, which is supposedly rat and weevil and fireproof. And basically what he did was he took a granary, and he made the whole thing out of stone, and they put them on these little pedestals that are thin at the bottom and fat at the top, so rats, if they're crawling up, them, bonk their heads and fall back down. But 
I don't think there's any evidence that anybody ever built a granary like this, but people were clearly thinking about test problems and were trying to come up with uh, really practical solutions to get at uh, fixing them. Uh, however, that being said, uh, as I mentioned with like Apollo and the gods, there was still a lot of mystic stuff going on. There's this dude, this is uh, Pliny the Elder. He was a Roman uh, from 70 BCE, and he was a, uh, a famous, uh, basically a Navy admiral in the Roman Navy. And so he traveled the world, and he came back, and he thought that he wanted to write this book called Natural History, which basically was a compilation of all the knowledge he had gathered over his lifetime. And it's more or less essentially the first encyclopedia uh, that was ever created. And within his encyclopedia, he has a whole lot of stuff about pest control techniques. And some of this stuff was really spot on. Uh, back then, a lot of people lived in houses where you lined the floor with uh, reeds or with straw. Uh, were really great breeding grounds for lice and fleas and all sorts of stuff that live inside houses uh, and feed on humans. And so he figured out, or he had heard that if you spread this mint, uh, mentha pulegium, on the floor, that it would scare the fleas away. And that was true. It actually worked. Uh, on the flip side, a lot of it was nonsense and hearsay because someone had told him that this worked and he just wrote it down and you know, figured out that that was good enough. So for example, in natural history, he has a recommendation for how you can control um, caterpillars and sparrows when you first plant millet. So probably this is designed to stop <coughs> sparrows from coming in and eating your seed right after you plant it, and similarly to stop cutworms from coming along and chewing off uh, you know, your young plants at the base. And this might seem obvious to all of you because, you know, we're living in the 21st century, but, you know, this is pretty new for them. So the first thing you do is before you do the hoeing, you got to go and catch a bramble frog, obviously. It's a frog that lives in the brambles. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So you got your bramble frog, and clearly the next thing you do is the night before you do your hoeing and you put the seeds in, You'll go to the field and you'll walk around the perimeter holding your bramble frog. Okay, so you walk around your field. Next, you will walk into the middle of the field and you'll take out your earthen jug. I'm sorry, you have to have an earthen jug too. You put the frog in the earthen jug and you're going to bury it in the ground, right in the middle of your field. All right, and that will protect you from the sparrows and from the caterpillars. But, and I'm sure you all figured this out, clearly you're saying, but Dr. Wenger, what if you don't get the frog before you harvest? Well, that will turn your product bitter. So make sure that you get your frog out before you harvest, or else, you know, the mill is going to be no good. So, yeah, this is nonsense. <laughs> and this is what a lot of people were doing. Uh, but the main point being that there were a lot of pests we didn't know what to do with. And so people would come up with these sort of extravagant ways that were relied on mysticism and magic and the gods and sort of trying to control their fate in a situation where they felt like they had very little control. So moving a little beyond that, so moving away from the Romans and the like, uh, in 300 BC we have the first recorded example of biological control, which is actually a really cool situation. So in East Asia, uh, in China specifically, where they had citrus groves, uh, they had these, um, essentially these predatory yellow citrus ants, and they would set up a nest near the base of a tree and they would crawl up in the tree and they would feed on all of the insects that lived in it, providing natural biocontrol. Uh, and what the Chinese figured out was if they took these bamboo splints and they tied them to the branches between the trees, they would create little ant highways so that ants feeding on one tree could travel to all of their neighbor trees. So they could create a little web that basically traveled throughout their orchard so that a single colony could provide protection for several trees. And so this is something that's still practiced excuse me, in a lot of uh, groves around China. Um, in the 200 BC, we had Cato the Elder, which is another Roman. He was basically arguing that we should use refined oils and charcoal for pest control, and clearly we still use refined oils uh, in order to control pests, especially with things like dormant sprays. So these are things that were discovered over 2,000 years ago but are still in use. And then in 1,000 to 1,300 AD, so in some cases a little less than a thousand years ago, we see biocontrol being used in more of the Western world. Uh, in the Arabian Peninsula, they were also using predatory ants in order to protect their dates, uh, but they had to basically go up to the mountains 
collect whole colonies and bring them down uh, into the date fields every season. So consequently, if you want your ants to do the good work, you need to have a queen, so you have to dig far enough down to find the queen, dig up the whole colony, and bring them back and put that colony in the dirt in your date orchard in this case. And again, at this time, we're just seeing a lot of progress in a lot of areas, whether it's weed control, crop rotation, cultivation methods. Generally, the point is that we're getting to a point now where enough people are doing agriculture, enough people are interested in this, that we're seeing a lot of progress happening very quickly. Unfortunately, right in the midst of this, from the uh, Western society perspective, we had a big setback in terms of progress with the fall of the Roman Empire. So around 500 AD, uh, the Roman Empire collapsed for various reasons that would be better covered in a Western civilization course than here. But the main point is that Europe, uh, the Mediterranean area, so North Africa, parts of the Middle East, but most of the Middle East fared pretty well, were kind of thrown backwards. Uh, they lost a lot of pest control knowledge, a lot of knowledge in general. Pest control was just one of the aspects. And we shifted from a government that was largely set up in sort of the Greek and Roman style, which was very much focused on uh, sort of the Greek ideals of democracy, of um, intellectualism, of university education, things like that, and moved a little bit more towards a shift uh, towards the Catholic Church, which was a little bit more interested in the, uh, the spiritual world and was less interested in sort of uh, scientific pest control. It should be noted that most of the Middle East and China escaped this fate because they weren't a part of the Roman Empire to begin with. So agriculture progressed pretty quickly in those areas. Uh, it continued to progress along the same lines it had been. So the ultimate sort of thing that happened here is we went from having a lot of sort of incremental scientific steps towards better pest control, and we basically reverted back to a faith and superstition model of pest control. And you start seeing really interesting stories of uh, pests being driven back. In 666 AD, there's a story that St. Magnus uh, showed up to a locust infestation with the, st the staff of St. Columbia and, you know, sort of held it forth and all the locusts fled and, you know, <coughs> drove themselves into the sea and such things. Or uh, there's a book, the Geoponica, which was the, as far as I can tell, the world's first agricultural uh, textbook that was written at that time. And there's stories about how, uh, in the Geoponica, they talk about how if you want to get mice to leave your field, what you can do is you can write a note to the mice and stick it under a rock in the field that basically says, hey, I get that you're mice and you need to eat and stuff, but I'm trying to grow something here. Would you mind going you know, to the next plot over and live in there instead of here? That'd be really great, sincerely, Farmer Joe, or whatever. you know. Like, basically, the idea was you could write a note to the mice, and they would leave. And so this led to some really interesting situations of, of pest control. My personal favorite is, um, is the, the religious trials they had back in the Middle Ages uh, to try and prosecute pests for uh, causing harm to people. So um, the basic idea here was that pest infestations, again, being sort of viewed... This is an interesting sort of confluence of cultures. So because we went back to a superstitious model of pest control, uh, pests were largely viewed as being divine retribution. But the Catholic Church was sort of a pseudo-government, and they had a whole court system. And so it just sort of worked out that essentially what you could do is if pests are religious and you have all these religious courts, you can take pests and try them in a religious court and uh, basically have a judge rule on sort of their status of whether they are, uh, what you can do rightfully under the law and the eyes of God to control these pests. So essentially there was this idea that pests could fall under two major categories in a religious courtroom. Either uh, these pests are God's justice for a village's sins. So basically some courts might interpret that, oh, well, you got this infestation of locusts it's because you're a sinful person and God is punishing you. So these are God's tool to basically distribute justice in the world. Alternatively, there's the interpretation that they are the devil's minions and that the devil is, you know, um, unjustly punishing you because the devil's a bad dude. And so um, in which case, I didn't include it here, but so in the first case, if they are God's justice 
then you have to repent. You know, you've got to pray, you've got to fast, you've got to ask for God's forgiveness for the pest to leave. Whereas alternatively, if they are the devil's minions, you need to punish the pests. Sometimes this was excommunicating the pests so they couldn't be part of the church anymore. Um, (laughs) You could banish them so you could tell them to leave the land. Uh, You could uh, relocate the pests. There were lots of solutions. This is a picture here of a, um, a pest trial. Actually, this is an animal trial. I couldn't find any pictures of an actual pest trial. But this is a situation, uh, a very famous trial, in which people owned a lot of livestock and they lived in villages. So it was commonplace to have pigs and sheep and cows and the like roaming around in the city. And uh, so in this little town, someone had a mother pig, uh, a sow, with uh, a litter of Piglets. What do you call a litter of piglets? It's a litter. It's a litter? Excellent. Look at that. Just pulling that out of thin air right there. Uh, but anyway, she had this litter of piglets, and a young boy uh, was uh, pestering the piglets. Uh, it's not said to what extent, but the mother pig killed the boy. And so the pig was put on trial for murder uh, for the child. And essentially, uh, the, the pig had a tr- the The boy's family had a lawyer who was the prosecutor, and the pig had a defender. And and they they ran through this whole trial, and ultimately the judge ruled that the pig has an innate right to defend its children from harm, and that the boy was at fault, and so the pig was let off. And um, this caused quite the uproar, hence the picture and the people pointing accusingly. And this guy's doing like a Jim Halpert look at the camera type thing in the <laughs> office. You know, he's just like, I don't know what's going on here. But anyway, so my, my particular favorite story, though, of all of these is uh, the case of St. Julien, France. So St. Julien is a small village in the uh, Bordeaux region of France. And so naturally they produce wines. And uh, back in 1545, there was a plague of weevils that showed up. Uh, vine weevils, they basically settle down, they start feeding on the vineyards, and naturally this makes all the growers really unhappy. And so all these vineyard owners get together and they say, we got to do something about all these weevils. And so they uh, basically go to the religious court and they say, we want to uh, sue these weevils and get rid of them. Uh, Unfortunately for them, the judge ruled that the vineyards are a part of God's creation and that weevils are God's creatures, uh, just as we are. And so the weevils have just as much right to these uh, vineyards as the humans do. And the instructors were essentially, sorry, the villagers were instructed that they could pray and fast for forgiveness. And that that was essentially all they could do in God's eyes to relieve the situation. And they should just ask for the weevils to leave. So that's where that story ends. But then in 1587, the weevils came back. Uh, Certainly not the same weevils, but the same species of weevil. They show up and another lawsuit is pressed. And in this case, the judge rules that these are devil's minion type weevils, and the weevils are ordered that you have 10 days, and you have to leave the vineyards, and you have to take up residence in a different, take up residence in a different parcel of land outside of town. And so basically, um, all of the growers were asked to designate a spot to sort of tape it off, and they wrote a note to the weevils and basically said, you have 10 days, you have to move out to this particular parcel. Now, naturally, the weevils did not leave. Uh, they weren't very uh, impressed with the note <laughs> or the ruling. And uh, so the growers became quite irate. They, they, they didn't really understand. You know, Well, they did understand, but they were pissed. And so you know, the, the growers are upset, and they go to the judge, and they basically say, you know, you got to tell these guys to move. And so... The defense lawyer for the weevils, because they had one, uh, he basically says that he went out and inspected the land, and he went to the vineyards and he talked to the weevils. And uh, the weevils told him, and quote, that the land was, quote, sterile and neither sufficiently nor suitably supplied with food. So basically the weevils took issue with the quality of the patch of land they were given. They're sitting here thinking, I've got this really nice plot of vineyard that I'm feeding on right now. You know, why am I going to go move to this little barren piece of land with some shrubs and junk on it? That's not what I want. And so, uh, consequently, this was enough to hold another trial. uh, But the problem is that the the judge's decision is ultimately unknown at this point. And that's because some sort of insect ate the page uh, (laughs) that it was written out on. 
So whether it was a weeble or uh <laughs> no, this is totally serious. <laughs> this was a real thing. This happened. <laughs> There are people who were lawyers for weevils. <laughs> Not all the time, but you know, sometimes you're like, <laughs> no, it's recorded, exactly. Like, <laughs> sometimes you go to law school, right? And you're out of law school and you got to start a practice. And what do you do? You go and you, you do the public defender thing and you get like 300 bucks a client or something. And sometimes the clients are weevils. And um, <laughs> but anyway, so that's the end of the story there. And so why do, I, why do I bring up these pest trials? Why, why are we talking about them? And I think, on one hand, I bring them up because they're funny. And um, they're just a really interesting part of human history, and specifically about pest control. But I think that they also demonstrate a really serious problem with pest control at this point, that pest populations could be prevented. Um, there was a little bit of background knowledge around biocontrol, so introducing birds and ants, there's evidence that people would like build perching structures for birds. You know, obviously we talked about the ant situation with moving colonies or building bridges, things like that. Uh, there was cultural control. People were uh, familiar with crop rotation, field preparation, and there was also tons of mechanical control. Uh, that was sort of the major basis. And so the idea was that if you did all of these things right, you could, you know, sort of prevent. You could suppress the pest populations from ever getting really big. But the challenge was that once you got to the outbreak, outbreak level, you were out of luck. There wasn't anything you could do. So if you got a swarm of locusts, if you got a bunch of weevils showing up, uh, you basically had no control tools. There weren't really any super effective chemical controls. And as of the modern day right now, basically, if we have an outbreak of pests, the only thing we can do is do these sorts of chemical controls. And this led to sort of these outrageous long-shot attempts at controls, such as the trials, the banishments, excommunications, all of those sorts of things. There was, there was one I, I read about, I didn't put it on a slide, but there was a pest control situation, uh, a trial where, I'm trying to remember if it was rats or locusts. I think it was locusts. They, the punishment was that they were going to baptize them and remove the... Uh, the devil, and so they had this whole thing where they were like dunking <laughs> these locusts underwater and shouting, you know, uh, excommunications and the like, and it just, it strikes me as really bizarre. But so anyway, that's just kind of where we're at, uh, at the end of the Dark Ages, this is even where we were at uh, towards the end of the Roman and the Greek Age. And what really started to turn things around was uh, the <coughs> Renaissance in Europe. So we're talking sort of... Um, 1600s, right around about the time that this kicked in. And it was basically, the Renaissance means the rebirth. And so the rebirth is kind of the time where uh, Europe as a whole kind of gets all their stuff together and they start uh, really making a lot of progress in areas where they've been stumbling around for a while. And it's really, most importantly in terms of pest control, the rebirth of scientific thought in Europe. It's when uh, the scientific method is really well developed it's when we develop sort of a gentleman class of scientific researchers who are really digging into practical and applied problems. And so a huge advancement was in the 1600s, they invented the microscope. And this led to a generally increased understanding of what insects and microorganisms were, how they functioned, um, and generally came up with this idea of German cell theory, the idea that Multicellular organisms are made up of tiny cells that all function independently, and that there are tiny pieces, uh, there are tiny life forms that we can't see but cause huge changes in our bodies when we get infected with them. Because if you think about it, if you don't have any notion of germ theory, and you're a grower, and you go out to check on your wheat, and it's covered with some sort of red scabby substance, you know, what are you going to make of that? You know, it was fine last week when you went out, but now it's covered in this fungi, but you don't know what a fungus is. You don't know that there are tiny organisms. For you, it looks like evil spirits. It looks like the wrath of God. It really makes it difficult to try and sort of solve these problems from a practical perspective, because what can you do about the wrath of a God other than burying bramble frogs all over the place? <laughs> so you're kind of limited. So with germ theory, at least, it gave people a context to think about this. All of a sudden, you're not looking at the wrath of a god. You're not looking at some curse 
that that crone across the street put on you, you know, you're looking at a bacterium or a fungi, something that you actually can do something about. On top of this, you started to see some really basic research that was solving some big problems that it's surprisingly, it's surprising that we didn't solve them before 400 years ago. Like this guy, this is Francesco Reddy, and he proved that maggots come from eggs laid by flies. So basically, he proved that flies reproduce sexually and have eggs. Before that, the previous sort of uh, prevailing thought was that flies spontaneously arise from dung or rotting meat. So basically, if you just put out dung, um, somehow the, all of the molecules in dung would somehow come together to create fly eggs, which would turn into maggots. And people really thought that until about 1668. And uh, so again, if that's your sort of conception, then you're sitting there thinking, well, my barn is full of cow dung, you know, and flies come from cow dung, so I'm just always going to have flies. So you're not thinking about cleaning up the cow dung. You're not thinking about controlling the adult flies. You know, you're doing sort of a, a bare minimum. And then in addition to this, we had Carl Linnaeus come along. And it's, Carl Linnaeus did a very simple thing. But I think his contribution is really hard to sort of overstate. Like Carl Linnaeus basically came along and he invented modern systematics. So he created the system that we use to name organisms. So again, back to economic entomology, the um, King Philip came over for green snakes, you know, type system, kingdom phylum, blah, 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 genus species. He came up with all of that. He came up with the binomial, scientific uh, binomial nomenclature. So the idea that all organisms have a scientific name, which is two parts, the genus and the species part, and they're written in Latin. And the idea that every organism only gets one of these. Unlike common names where you have things like a Helicoverpa zea, the uh, corn rootworm, or the corn earworm, the tomato fruitworm, and the cotton bullworm are all the same names for the same organism, but they only get Helicoverpa zea as the scientific name. So in addition to coming up with this system, he also did a lot of work of collecting specimens, having people mail specimens to him. He would identify them. He would write out how to identify them. He would write out the scientific name in a great big book. They would print it up periodically and send it all over the place. So suddenly, everybody was on the same page. Uh, you know, whereas at one point, somebody might know something really useful for controlling corn earworm, uh, but you know, the people working with cotton bullworm don't realize that. And maybe they don't realize they're working with the exact same pest. But if they get this book and they look at it, it's a sort of a compendium of all of the knowledge that we have about this pest and all of its different common names. It really sort of just brings all this information together and really gets us all talking about the same thing. And realizing that there are these distinct species and that they're not just some vagary sort of um, moth thing. The other thing Linnaeus did, and he did this under a pen name, so he never did this uh, in his own books, but through his research and looking at all these organisms, he came to the conclusion that, quote, every pest has a natural enemy and that we should capture and use these to disinfest crops. So he was one of the early people really advocating for biocontrol in, uh, European, in Europe. Excuse me. So yeah, he's, he's kind of ahead of the times on that as well. All right. So ultimately, all of this knowledge kind of came together and it caused an agricultural revolution in Europe. So that essentially from 1750 to 1880, so about a um, you know, 130 year period, uh, agriculture in Europe changed dramatically. We shifted from a subsistence farming model where basically people owned little patches of land that they rented from a lord and they just grew enough food to pay their taxes to the lord and to feed their family. Then we switched to a more commercial farming format where lords would hire professional farmers who would farm a lot of land and use all of their product. They would sell their product and use the money to support their families instead of growing food for themselves. And through this model, we saw increases in acreage, we saw higher yields, and we saw generally uh, greater use of fertilization, rotation, all of these things that made farming more productive. And on top of that, we also saw the discovery of the first really effective insecticides and uh, fungicides. Things like pyrethrum and darus, which are extracted from natural plants, were discovered. Uh, 
There were a lot of pesticides that were developed that used things like arsenic and sulfur that are generally very toxic. And so what we saw was there was a sort of unfortunate lag where some pesticides were adopted before they were really understood safety-wise. So you had like a situation in France where um, a large number of field workers died in 17, sorry, a large number of farm workers were dying every year in France from arsenic poisoning because you would seed treat with arsenic. And ultimately France had to uh, do a prohibition on these seed treatments just to get that under control. And finally, we also saw that agriculture sort of shifted from being highly localized to being really global. We got to a point where, um, with the discovery of crops in the New World, all of a sudden we were planting crops in Europe and in North America that didn't exist there before. So we had things like tomatoes, potatoes, corn, all showing up in Europe that never existed before. And, uh, you know, ultimately we also had situations where harvests in one area could be sold to another. So by the late 1800s, early 1900s, California was selling almost all of their wheat to Europe. Very little of it stayed in the continental U.S. because they could get really good prices in Europe for it. So just a huge shift in how we thought about agriculture. And ultimately, all of these things came together to also create a system which was really ideal for pests. So we increased productivity. We decreased the number of people working on them. Uh, we created this global situation. And all of a sudden, we had set up a system that was really great for pests to move in and take advantage of. And so in the mid-1800s, we saw some of the greatest agricultural disasters that ever happened because of this system. Um, so fungus leaf spot showed up in Sri Lanka. This is a fungus that attacks uh, coffee. And basically, it created such a situation that they couldn't grow coffee in Sri Lanka anymore. They got rid of it completely and switched over to tea. Uh, this is arguably the reason why the British are totally into tea and don't drink as much coffee like most other nations on Earth. Because Sri Lanka was a uh, colony of theirs. And it was their primary source of coffee. And once it got knocked out, tea was the replacement. Uh, we also had the famous potato blight showing up. So uh, the Phytophthora intestines, which caused the, um, you know, the great potato famine. And then perhaps most famously, at least from a pest control perspective, would be the fact that grapes in Europe took a huge double whammy from powdery mildew and from grape phylloxera. And powdery mildew and grape phylloxera are arguably the first outbreaks that were due completely to intervention from people. Uh, basically from the idea that when people came to North America, they discovered all sorts of um, North American grapes, and they wanted to see how they would do in Europe, and they brought them over and inadvertently introduced all of these pests that they didn't realize they could transport so easily. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more detail about mildew and phylloxera, so... Apologies, since you've already heard about some of this in economic entomology. But these two pests really define how we handled pests for about the next 50 years. And so I think it's important just to do a brief overview. So grape phylloxera. These guys were a uh, small hemipteran pest. They are itty-bitty, typically uh, from the one millimeter to less than one millimeter long uh, size range, that are native to North America, feeding on grape stocks, grape rootstocks there. Uh, and they were eventually introduced to Europe. So these guys hang out on the roots, they feed on them, they can form um, uh, little galls, and generally just sort of suck the life out of the plants, can cause um, scarring that blocks the flow of nutrients, and generally just cause all sorts of trouble. Uh, when they were introduced to Europe, they encountered all these grapevines that had no exposure to grape phylloxera ever. So they had no natural resistance to them. And so grape phylloxera, which were maybe a nuisance in North America, were completely devastating in Europe. Uh, there's estimates that they killed between 66 and 99% of all European vineyards uh, in the short time after they were introduced. And in total, they reduced the total amount of wine from 84.5 million hectoliters down to 23.4. So we're looking at about a fourfold decrease in total production just from this pest. And of course, my main man Charles Valentine Riley showed up and that's kind of the famous story. It's sort of what put him on the map uh, as a review. Uh, C.V. Riley was the father of economic entomology in North America. He really set up sort of the extension system as we know it now. He shifted the USDA's focus in entomology away from discovering new species and moved it towards uh, pest control and answering agricultural problems. 
And he had this idea that, well, why don't we take these native uh, North American root stocks and we'll stick them onto the European varieties. And since these guys don't do so well on the American root stocks, maybe that'll help provide control. And as it worked out, it really did. Um, ultimately, this was the first really effective demonstration of how uh, joining together different rootstocks can, can be used to create resistant cultivars. And it's really changed the way we do things. I mean, to the extent that here in California, basically nothing is grown with its original rootstock anymore. You're more or less selecting the rootstock to match the variety that you want on top uh, to provide the most control for pests or the best efficiency. So uh, ultimately, resistant cultivars proved so effective at controlling many pests that it was really a major focus for how they controlled pests moving forward from this point out. And C.V. Riley was ultimately given, uh, he was indu inducted into the Royal Order of the Chevalier, which is the highest civilian honor you can get in France. And if I understand correctly, he is the only non-French person to ever win that. So that's how much the French love their wine. Uh, and powdery mildew, so one of the other reasons that the grapes had such a hard time dealing with phylloxera was that powdery mildew was introduced to Europe at about the exact same time. So it was sort of compounding the entire problem. And ultimately, powdery mildew was sort of the way that we got into a lot of chemical controls that were oriented towards fungi. So powdery mildew was hanging out, causing all sorts of problems. Uh, but one day, an agricultural research type guy was walking down a country road, and he noticed that in uh, this one particular stretch of the road, there were all of these orchard, all these vineyards that were getting totally devastated by powdery mildew, except for the vines that lined right next to the road. And so he's like, why are these ones that are right by the road still healthy and don't have powdery mildew, but all the other ones do? And what it worked out was that the farmer who was growing there, he was using a mixture of copper and lime on the roadside plants to try and kill them. It wasn't working real well, but what it was doing was it was drifting over and landing on the grapevines and was killing the fungus, uh, the spores that were landing on it. And this ultimately resulted in what they call the Bordeaux mixture, uh, hydrated lime and copper sulfate, which is one of the most widely used fungicides in the world still. And uh, essentially, this led sort of a revolution of people investigating new fungicides and came out with sort of things like Paris Green, which is a common insecticide. Actually, if you go back to the literature and you look at some of these old insecticides, they'll all have weird names like Paris Green or um, Chiffon Blue and things like that. And it's because they used a lot of really toxic substances to make dyes back then. And so Paris green was an arsenic-based dye used to make wallpapers that was really popular in Paris, hence Paris green. But they figured out you could spray the dye on the crops, and uh, it would kill insects as well. And so, um, yeah, it was maybe sort of, sort of like the lead paint of the day. I was told a different story about the development of the Bordeaux mixture. Oh, really? It was, it was sprayed on the vineyards um, here at university make them look unappealing to students who have to be strolling through the vineyards. Oh, really? That's what I heard. Oh. Uh, and then it was discovered that, hey, man, this stuff. It actually it works. works. It's not just. <laughs> I'll, I'll take a look into that. I haven't heard that one, but that sounds. Dr. Stress told that story twice. Oh, did he? I've heard it from Dr. Ellis. Dr. Ellis? OK. Well, then maybe I'm off base. Well, maybe you're not. Well, who knows? We'll see. I'll take a look. This is the one I've always heard, but um, I would be curious about that. That sounds like you would hear these stories of um, back in the day when, um, you know, sailing was all, I'm sorry, I'm taking up your time, so um, you can go. I'm just going to tell this brief story. But uh, <laughs> back in the day when sailing ships was the primary way that you got from point A to point B, uh, you know, scurvy was a big problem. And so basically there was this big effort to find ways to fix scurvy and Various government people knew that vitamin C was the key, and they knew the types of food you could use to give people vitamin C. And one of the early popular ways was uh, sauerkraut, you know, just fermented cabbage. And so um, the problem was sauerkraut was so offensive to various sailors that they didn't want to eat it. And so um, they would serve it to them, and they'd just throw it away, and people still got scurvy. And so what they did was they took the sauerkraut, and they started putting it in barrels and stamping on it uh, officers only. And so all the sailors would sneak the, uh, the sauerkraut out of the barrels, and uh, the scurvy problem uh, cleared up on those ships. Anyway.